You're listening to the Parent Pod Podcast by Jimboree Play and Music with Adonica Shaw, a weekly conversation about early childhood development topics for parents with children ages zero to five. While the content of this show is meant to be informative, it is not meant to replace the guidance of your physician, therapist, or pediatrician. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Parent Pod Podcast by Jimbery Plain Music. I'm your host, Adonica Shaw. Today, we have the absolute pleasure of speaking with Christine Michelle Carter, who happens to be the associate editor of Modern Mom and a contributor for Forbes Women, as well as the author of the best selling book, Can Mommy Go to Work? Christine, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Adonica. I am so excited. (laughs) Thank you. Now, I know that I've seen your bio and it's expansive. And I just want to kind of give you the opportunity to kind of self-introduce, tell our our listeners a little bit more about yourself, your background, your specialty. If people were to hear about you, which things would they most likely resonate with or where have they likely heard about you from? So I have the reputation of being the number one global voice for working moms. So they probably read my articles for Modern Mom or my articles for Forbes Women. I write about how today's mother balances work and life. Um, I also work with brands, so they might know me as a consultant or a speaker. I help educate brands on how to attract and retain millennial parents as talent from an HR perspective, and then how to target them as consumers from a consumer marketing perspective. Um, They might know me from my books, Mom AF, which is kind of a tongue-in-cheek book for mothers, and Can Mommy Go to Work, which is my children's book. Or they might know me through my work with Mompreneur and Me, which is the organization that I founded, which is free. And it's the first national Mommy and Me professional development event. So they might know me a few ways. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. That's just so exciting. The fact that you have so many different hats that you're able to, uh, to wear. But more importantly, the fact that you have so many venues for people to connect with you and for you to help uh, drive conversations around what motherhood looks like, what things that we might struggle with, um, both on the job or just in our personal day to day lives. You know, I am just so thankful that we were able to connect with you um, in doing research with our team here at Jimbery Play and Music, we were able to connect with you today to talk a little bit about your work around maternal mental health. And so, again, we just want to thank you so much for your time today. And I want to I dive right in. And so with that being said, and I know that you do quite a bit of work around this, but in your perspective, what does maternal mental health encompass? And what does it mean for a mother to be mentally healthy on a day-to-day basis, whether she's pregnant or already has children. Yeah. So maternal mental health to me involves every aspect of motherhood while a woman is pregnant and also postpartum. It doesn't necessarily mean being free of any type of challenges such as depression, anxiety, or ADHD, right? Because depression and anxiety impact one in five pregnant and postpartum women. But the mental health aspect of it and thriving with those conditions is the ability to seek help and to be able to communicate about it and communicate about it with a therapist and with a a mom tribe, with a community. Because I find that in my work, a part of the challenge, if not all of the challenge with women is the fact that we suffer in silence with so many different aspects of our lives. The, the challenges of work-life balance, the challenges of raising children and in today's, in today's world, um, we just suffer in silence. And the idea of being maternally um, healthy from a mental perspective is just the ability to communicate and say that I need help. Um, I, I can't suffer alone. Oh my goodness. So I know that you speak on so many panels about this particular topic. Is there anything that has happened to you in your own personal journey to being able to balance work, life, stress, anxiety, uh, just in terms of you being a person and as a woman with being a mom as well? What is your journey to mental health? 
So uh, I struggled after I gave birth to my daughter eight year, nine years ago. Now she's celebrating her ninth birthday in June. So I ended up having preeclampsia and delivering at 31 weeks. I was having labor signs for four days before I actually delivered. And instantly I became invincible to every aspect in my life or everything that was going on in my life at that moment, except for if it related to my child, which to me is almost like a moot data point because I can't go back in time and not have a child, right? So that means that my daughter encompassed my world and then I became completely vulnerable. Like I could handle everything in my life if as long as it didn't involve my daughter. And then once it did, which was after I gave birth, I became completely anxious. I completely felt like the world was closing in on me. I thought that everything related to her and I was going to fail somehow. And just juggling with those emotions and then returning to work and having to travel internationally, I would get on the planes and have the worst anxiety because I thought if I died or the plane went down, my daughter would not have me around. And that's when I decided to seek medical attention for it. So I started going to a therapist and I also told my primary care doctor that I think I needed to be on some type of medication to help with my anxiety. And then um, just from a, um, as a writer, I, I felt like, again, my mission is to tell women they're not alone. So I wanted to write about it. And mm -hmm. I wrote a piece for Health Magazine about how I was on a plane and I was suffering from anxiety and I just poured my heart out. And of course, women um, wrote to me and told me they could completely agree. So I made a vow then and there whenever it came to writing about my mental health um, or just expressing how I was feeling, I would be completely transparent. And over the years, I've continued to do that through my mm -hmm. social media and through my writing. But most recently, I've, um, COVID has, um, of course, made me stuck in the house with my five-year-old, my second child, who is a rambunctious boy. And I'm starting to notice patterns of in him of being like hyperactive and whatnot. So that made me go down, like I do, the wormhole of researching. And I found <laughs> that... <laughs> I found that many women with uh, di the diagnosis of ADHD in women and girls is actually on the rise, particularly in mothers, and mothers find it inside themselves once they become mothers and are raising a boy. They start to see similarities. So um, I've recently started writing about that too. And of course, because of COVID, I haven't been able to see my primary care doctor, but I think that there's something there. I definitely think that that might also be the case with me. So expect to see those <laughs> those articles coming pretty soon. <laughs> so I'll definitely look out for them. You know, it's quite interesting. And so, you know, I haven't really shared it so much on that podcast, but um, I delivered my third child at 34 weeks because of preeclampsia as well. Well, it was interesting to your earlier point, you know, I had been going out to events and people were like, oh, you have toxemia. And I'm like, what does that mean? Right. <laughs> it was like, uh, okay, sure. You know, and my first two children I had in my twenties. And so at the time I was like, you know, maybe it's just the difference of having a child in your 30s versus your 20s. Because the mm -hmm. first two, like, I really didn't gain much weight. Um, I was able to exercise and run. I looked pretty normal. And I, I bounced back pretty quickly. And then the third, in my 30s, I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm swollen. I'm like, I guess this is what it looks like when you just get older and you um, give birth. I had no idea that proclampsia is something that disproportionately impacts certain women of color, for example. Right. Um, and I had no idea that I was at risk for it or what to happen other than um, I just kind of felt queasy and I honestly didn't even want to go to the hospital because I didn't think that I really needed to. But um, the nurses were pretty much on top of me like, just come, just come. And I, you know, I left my dinner on the table and went over thinking I was going to return home that night. And that's just not what happened. I was there. Right. We ended up in NICU and to your point as well, just every thought having a pregnancy experience that was pregnancy and birth experience that was radically different than the first two that I had had, but then having this additional layer of anxiety and stress and um, high blood pressure and knowing how important it was going to be from that point in my life forward to manage my anxiety levels. Because I believe, and don't quote me because I'm not a doctor, but I believe with preeclampsia, um, 
I think there's like within a 10 year time range from the point that you have it, you're more at risk from suffering from certain um, anxiety disorders, high blood pressure, depression. And so Mm -hmm. my life dramatically changed at that point too. It's kind of crazy. I didn't know that we had that in common. Um, Yeah. You know, and I think to your point as well, you know, in terms of being able to transition back into a work environment, whether you've had preeclampsia or not, um, that is certainly a huge event for any woman because it's, you know, like, oh, oh my, my gosh, gosh. <laughs> what, yeah. where is my child doing right now? What am I missing? You know, I know Why things- are they not prepared for me to return, <laughs> you know, and oh my gosh, yeah. I, I would love to hear your perspective because I know certainly over time as more women are actually opting to go back to work because I feel like there was a yeah. time when it was just like, people say they're going to come back but then they don't really come back or that it was kind of frowned upon for you to not stay home. Whereas now women are returning because, you know, some of it being necessity, but the other part of it being like, they really like their job and they really like their career. And so they don't want to lose footing within that space. And so what would be your perspective on the changing face of what mental health looks like now that more women are actually opting to go back to their nine to five? Well, I think that the changing face of mental health is unfortunately many of these women, especially first time mothers are suffering in silence and they don't understand how much your brain changes that first year after giving birth. Um, To your point, even if you haven't experienced preeclampsia, all of the, um, just the cognitive development that happens and also the risk that you put yourself in of, of having depression and anxiety and, 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 and all of those different things. Um, it's funny when you were talking about your, your return and, and what that possibly looked like. I remember after having preeclampsia and delivering at 31 weeks in a day, my daughter spent a month in the NICU but I only had six weeks leave because I had a C-section and I certainly didn't want to sit around um, for four weeks at home. Um, But at the same time, I did enjoy what I was doing and um, I wanted to return to work and then maybe take my leave a little bit after when she came out of the NICU. But I remember for those first six weeks um, when I was trying to, you know, navigate a schedule of returning to the office while having a child in the NICU and visiting her um, at all hours of the day and night because NICUs are open 24 hours. I felt like I was in purgatory because I didn't feel comfortable at work and I didn't feel comfortable at home without my child. I just felt like I was in limbo. And then when I returned to work, the workplace wasn't even designed for me to be successful as a mother. I didn't have a mother's room or any place to pump. I was pumping in a bathroom stall and I had to really become an advocate within the organization because it was mostly men in tech. It was a tech startup. I had to for the fact that this is unacceptable. Um, And then I just would spend nights crying about the fact that I had a child in NICU. So I'm balancing all of those different emotions. And for a long time, I suffered in silence until I realized that enough was enough and I needed to seek professional help. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of getting any type of support during this time frame, did you have personal friends and family that understood kind of what you were going through? Was anybody actively advocating for your mental health and wellness, or is this something that you had to kind of come to terms with by yourself and then do your own research on how to move your life forward beyond that life-changing event of giving birth pre, uh, I hate to say preliminarily, but giving birth before term. So um, from a medical perspective, my gynecologist wasn't and my primary care wasn't. The moment that hit me um, that I'll always remember is I purchased two books about having anxiety um, from Amazon and had them delivered to my house. And my mother was helping me with just... um, washing clothes and cooking and whatnot in the the first few weeks um, after I gave birth to my daughter. And she found the books and she just kind of looked at me and tilted her head and gave me a half smile and closed the drawer. As if to say, I wasn't alone in my suffering and that what I was feeling 
was completely normal. However, it didn't give me comfort to talk about the experience and it didn't give me the idea that, uh, you know, she had found a solution, you know, Um, and, and I, and I see that in older generations where we are no different from them, but we are just more vocal and willing to communicate about our problems. And I don't know, something in me just decided I didn't want to then turn to my daughter one day and just tilt my head and smile to her. I really wanted to say, I suffered through the same thing and I took this and I took that and I tried this and I tried that. And I feel like because I am so vocal and I communicate, it's already benefiting me from a mother daughter perspective. Like my daughter is very vocal about her mental health. Uh, Mm -hmm. Even with the pandemic, she feels overwhelmed by virtual schooling. So she's able to express her words. I feel anxious. I feel nervous. I feel sad. I can't miss, I can't see my friends. And that's not really something that I understood. Mm -hmm. You know, I will say that it is definitely a huge difference, um, I would say, than generations prior. So I'm in my mid-30s, and I know that I've had conversations with mentors, family members, my own mother even, in terms of just the differences between now where women are more vocal, but I feel like the other part of it, too, is that society and our culture in general is more open to listening to women and hearing our voices, whereas, you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago, um, that unfortunately just wasn't the case. And so I think that we're quite, quite blessed in many ways uh, to have the ability to not only advocate for ourselves and our own health, and then, you know, even just the silver lining of the fact that you did work at a tech company, and that you could, you know, go to somebody and say, hey, I need X, Y, and Z, and that you are in an environment where people can at least attempt to show up, you know, and you never know what companies right. will do if you do make the request, but feeling confident and empowered enough to know yeah. that you need to do something different for your life to set yourself up for success. And so that sense of yeah. self advocacy is so inspiring. And, um, for women who are already struggling through the life changing event of, giving birth, whether it's the first, second, third time, fourth, you know, it's always a different experience when you have it always a, is. a new baby. Yeah. I feel like there's a misconception. It's like, oh, it's going to be the same every time. Oh, it's not. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's interesting. Not. So my, so my second time when I gave birth to my son, he was full term. He didn't want to leave my body. The minute he did, my blood pressure shot up to 230 and I could feel the nerves in my head pulsating and I could barely whisper help to the gynecologist in the room. Um, And afterwards, like after I came to and everything and had seen him and I think I was in my second day in the hospital and the neurologist came in the room and said, a woman of my age shouldn't be having, giving birth um, because I was older. And that's probably what happened. (laughs) This was the challenge of me giving birth at an old age. I was 29. I was 29. Oh. <laughs> so I, I decided in that moment. Age are you referring to? <laughs> right. Women I are was 29. To their, you know, 40s. And I don't You're know. Right. You know, I don't right. know for certain if it's in the early 50s, but I know 29 is certainly not something that I would consider to be older. I would consider exactly. To, you know, about the so, age you've been established a little bit in your career. And so it seems a little right. normal, 29 ish. Yeah. I was 29. So I had a breakdown, of course, my emotions are high and my mental health isn't isn't stable. And my gynecologist just came in the room and gave me his hand and just kind of comfort comforted me and said, don't listen to that. You know, you, you can continue to have children should you decide to. And that's a decision completely up to you. And just the empathy that he showed made me realize, okay, something has got to give. I had already been advocating for women in the workplace, but I'm missing something here. And it's the empathy. Like we, I have got to continue the fight for women uh, because who is giving them that empathy? Who's telling them, who is telling them that to protect their mental health and it's okay to feel how they feel. It's okay to feel scared and, and, and tired and everything that we feel as, as working mothers. Yeah, I can only, I can go on for days about the importance of bedside manner, particularly when it comes to giving birth. And then in that post period, whether you are able to leave the hospital within a day or so, or you're there for an extended 
um, amount of time, whether it has to do with your child or for yourself, um, that bedside manner and having doctors and um, medical professionals who really understand that mental health piece as opposed to the I'm coming in, you know, they're going to take your blood pressure, they're going to ask you if you need to be propped up, help you use the bathroom, um, make sure that you've got your food, you know, taking that extra step for empathy and for showing up for that person in that moment. It's just fantastic that it sounds like you had um, an, an individual and a provider that was attuned to what you were going through. And so I'm, I'm happy to hear that that happened and I can only continue to ask and impress upon those people that might work in the medical field or work directly with women who have just given birth to consider those factors. You know, it certainly is a huge part of the birthing experience and one that, you know, it sounds like that you're going to remember forever. Um, oh, absolutely. Now for women who and I, I don't want to isolate this just to women who've just given birth, but in terms of managing anxiety levels during pregnancy, and then maybe even for that first year or so after, I believe you mentioned a moment ago about your brain changes so much, and that's completely true. Um, what type of self-care, mental health activities for you know their day-to-day -day stress levels would you recommend? Did you paint? Did you exercise? Did you go to group therapy? Like what two or three hacks can you provide to our listeners on how to kind of manage those stress levels? So that's a lot to unpack. First, <laughs> I'm going to tell you what I do for self-care, completely understanding that self-care is very personal and think about a couple, right, and how they consider a romantic time. And one of uh, the woman might say, or a woman in the relationship may say, let's take a hot bubble bath. And the guy might say, this is hell because this water <laughs> is so hot. So self-care is different for everyone. However, for me, because I am a control freak, if I know what self-care activity I'm going to do, it becomes a chore and not a relaxation moment. So on my calendar, I have like a random calendar invite and mm -hmm. it, I can't see on the calendar until I click into the description what the self-care moment is. So on the calendar, it just says self-care moment. But when I look inside, it will say my favorite things to do, which is to get a manicure and a pedicure, have a spa day and get a massage to get my hair clipped and get my hair uh, curled or to go see my therapist. And those, the calendar invites just changes so, so frequently that I'm not able to keep up and say, okay, I know that I'm about to see my therapist. So let me just check that off. And then I'm going to go to the grocery store. It's, it's yeah. not like that. It's, a, it's an actual moment. Yeah. It sounds like it's set up very intentionally on your part. Um, very intentionally. I've gotten into the habit of scheduling my self care I, I don't know that I as intentional in terms of hiding it because I feel like I'm still a little too type A to completely hide it. From. <laughs> I'm a little too type A to kind of hide it completely from my schedule. Um, oh. But I am like, but you know what? I the fact that I have it on my calendar and that I have a budget for it now, whereas before it would just be like I would wait for something to happen. And then I'd be like, I need a moment, you know? Right. I, <laughs> I've got, and then it's too late. You've already hit burnout. And then yeah. I, I've gotten away from getting to this point of depletion. You know, now it's like, okay, I know that I can set aside and just throwing out a number like $150 per month for self care. Right. And these are the days I know that I've got free, but then kind of doing the calculation, oh, if I do this event, it's going to cost me like $50 or this one might cost me 75. So I do try to plan and know a little bit about what I'm doing to make sure that I stay on budget. But um, I feel like that was just a huge step for me. Exactly. Like I have a budget, I've got a set date and time, and I'm not going to wait to go bananas the minute life throws me over that edge. So for me, those were the little small steps that I took. Um, and then just trying different things, whether it's painting or going to like um, a professional development conference or listening. And I know it's kind of weird, but I listen to different like speeches and uh, there's a lot of speeches by different celebrities and whatnot that are on YouTube about mm -hmm. motivation and um, 
becoming your best self kind of thing. So those are some of the little hacks that I've learned along the way. Um, but see, that's my point. That's the, don't think that that's weird. That's how you unwind. That's your self. Yeah. That's my very point. To me, that's a chore and that would be work. But for you, that's how you unwind. A part of, sometimes my self-care includes watching Shark Tank because I love to be thinking just like outside the box about my businesses. And for some people, that seems like another form of work. For me, that's self-care. <laughs> uh, no, I'm with you on that one. I'm like, I love Shark Tank because you just never know who's going to show up on the show and um, yeah, kind of what activity or what product they're, they're going to come up with. But then also, depending upon which season you're on, how the sharks are going to respond. So yeah, really fun to watch. Um, we're coming to the end of the episode, and I just have two more questions for you. The first okay. is what two books or which book would you recommend to people who are either trying to define their self-care routine a little bit more or learn more about their own mental health and managing anxiety? And then the question I have after that is how can people find you? Sure. So to answer your first question, sometimes I feel like that journey when you're initially starting can be so overwhelming because the book seems so, um, uh, so rah rah, or an inspirational, or they're a little bit too technical and medical in nature. So I would recommend selfishly my book, Mom AF, because it is a book that was written with moms in mind, and I definitely chronicle my journey to understanding why some of my Type A personality I can't apply to certain things like self care. So it's just the hilarious evolution of me trying <laughs> to figure out what self care looks like for me. And also figuring out how to handle my anxiety. You can see some of my triggers, uh, cough, cough, my mother-in-law at the time in the <laughs> book. Um, and then some of the various and hilarious methods I tried to use to overcome it. But um, that's the book that I would recommend. And then, you know, follow it up with, okay, I'm not alone. So let me go ahead and look into to finding some solutions for me with my anxiety. Um, and then people can find me at christinemichellecarter.com. Oh, thank you so much for all of this. This has been such a, a good conversation, I think. Um, and I like that you're just so candid and open about your experience. And I do agree that some of the books that are out there, it's either they're extremely clinical, which is wonderful, right. but I'm just like your regular day-to-day -day person. And so I don't always understand the terminology. Plus, I feel like for people who've had various um, experiences around motherhood and childbirth and managing your stress levels, particularly around like anxiety, um, having somebody else who can talk a little bit about their story resonates a little bit more for me. So I tend to err on the kind of self-helpy, personal narrative kind of books. And so thank yeah. you so much for sharing yours. You know, I, I have to order it on Amazon now. And I think that the Amazon delivery times are mostly back to normal. Don't quote me on that, but I think that they are. <laughs> um, but no, I, I do appreciate your time today. And for those of you who are listening to this episode at home, we will go ahead and provide more details and description about the books that she has referenced and then give you all of her wonderful links and her uh, <laughs> website details in the description for this episode below. Thank you again for joining us for another episode of the Parent Pod Podcast, and we hope that you have a playful day. To learn more about this week's episode or the content discussed in the episode, be sure to follow Jimboree Play and Music on Facebook.